Vladislav Plevchinsky, managing editor of the American Spectator in this morning's New York Times, R.W. Apple writes, George Bush, through his appointments and his comments at news conferences, has begun to draw some sharp distinctions between the administration that's ending and the one that's beginning. Mr. Bush has moved with such dispatch and with such seeming confidence, in fact, that it sometimes seems almost as if he's governing rather than preparing to govern. Is George Bush already in charge? Well, uh, he probably is. George Will made that point yesterday that increasingly the transition is becoming uh, something that lasts quite too long and the press attention is already on on somebody new so which in this case is mr bush and so uh maybe we should move the inauguration date up christopher hitchens is george bush in charge two qualities in the incumbent he's already starting to grow mm -hmm. in office pick any cliche you like things we never knew about him before all coming true and a generally deferential mm -hmm press corps is only trying to just do the court all this. All he's doing is turning up at the meetings that have been scheduled for him. He's got to do that. The fact that Reagan mm -hmm. is and always has been a completely vacant presence um, in these things is, is made more plain by the contrast, I suppose. You say generally deferential press corps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Expand on that. I mean to say that, you know, someone who's mm -hmm. a winner is already discovered to have qualities of statesmanship that were undetected um, in him previously. Suddenly, you know, Bush is, um, well, in fact, very often also in the person's mm -hmm. own words. I mean, he is discovered to be kinder and gentler. I mean, you know, they, the press really well, pick up on the self-image of the person. Well, well, he's also the only show in town. He's the winner. He uh, clearly won a very easy victory over Michael Dukakis. And the press is now paying attention to the number one uh, political figure in the country who happens to be the president-elect. So it's natural that uh, he will be the focus of such stories. Of course, these stories also serve as a kind of filler between now and the inauguration. It's a slow period politically. So all attention is on Bush and who will he appoint to all the various cabinet, sub-cabinet positions. Along those lines, mm -hmm. the Washington Wire in, in the Wall Street Journal this morning uh, says, Bush basks in good reviews so far, but pace is likely to slacken. <laughs> President-elect gets generally so, high marks mm -hmm. for his first appointments mm -hmm. and for setting an off and running tone for his administration. You agree high marks for his first appointments? High marks? Sure, why not? Uh, I mean, these are good, competent, experienced people. I mean, he could do much worse. Maybe he'll do even better. Some other appointments. Um, how do conservatives feel generally about the appointments so far? Generally happy? Any I, mean, I, I don't want to speak for conservatives because I think there's a tendency to lump us all into one kind of camp. And it's not really true. Many conservatives are uh, distressed. Others are quite happy. It depends on their political sense, uh, their willingness to compromise, their understanding that <clears throat> Mr. Bush, uh, for all his conservatism, is also a a fairly pragmatic political actor, so he will be turning to people who are not necessarily uh, true blue conservatives, but still quite competent. Congratulations, good, good marks mm -hmm. so far on appointments? No, they, they're terrible people. I mean, it's the only thing that could be said in Baker's um, defense, if that's the word, is that he does anger ideological conservatives, the sort of fanatics of the sort who Reagan was fond of appointing to. Certain positions, Bush clearly doesn't have a taste for fanaticism. Well, in fact, I think I imagine for consistent thinking of any kind. But wh why should Baker get high marks? I mean, what for exactly? Um, this is a man who dealt in uh, stolen presidential papers for the Reagan debates in 1980, and has never explained his role in that theft. Uh, this is a guy who's just finished running a campaign of unexampled vulgarity and overt racism. Uh, that was agreed, even by those who don't agree with me, to be a really deplorable campaign. At the very best, trivial, I would say far worse than that, incitement to race hatred and, and extreme vulgarity and dishonesty. So, he's Secretary of State. Great. It takes a deferential press to record this as a statesman-like appointment. Well, I think Mr. Hitchens is simply repeating the old left liberal radical canard. Well, I have no that choice. Mr. Bush won because he fought dirty, when in fact he won because he fought politically, fought very well, fought back. People forget what was done to him at the Democratic Convention, and I don't recall Mr. Dukakis ever saying, hey, this is unseemly, let's not do this, let's win on the issues, let's win on ideas. Uh, Mr. Bush fought politically, won politically, and Mr. Baker uh, is highly respected in Washington, he's very competent, um, he's not a fanatic as Mr. Hitchens would probably agree, 
and why people want to uh, denigrate his political skills is beyond me. Sometimes news stories refer to Mr. Baker uh, in a position of perhaps being a, almost a, in a position of being prime minister or assistant yeah. president. What do you think is going to happen in that? Well, he, obviously, he's very close to Mr. Bush, uh, but he just doesn't have that that kind of ambition. I don't think to be the uh, number one figure in Washington. He's very willing, I think, to be Mr. Bush's top uh, and closest advisor, and he'll continue to serve in that capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting um, as a term, because as a term, the, uh, the term prime minister suggests mm -hmm. that the president must be a constitutional, or perhaps not even a constitutional monarch. Actually, you can't have a constitutional monarch in the United States because mm -hmm. the constitution is against monarchy. But the, the worry about monarchic presidency is given a sort of, I think, unintended spin by um, the idea of a prime ministerial Secretary of State. Other appointments this week, uh, the most recent one, General Scowcroft is head of the National uh, Security Council. What are your thoughts on that appointment? Uh, it's, it's mixed. He's obviously a very decent, uh, faithful public servant, served his country, I think, his entire life. Uh, his views on key defense issues such as Star Wars might disappoint some people. Uh, yet on, when it comes to start talks, he's also very cautious. Uh, so he's not going to rush into uh, any reckless um, policies, and um, I think he'll be a very um, reliable national security advisor to Mr. Bush. Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. General well, Scowcroft. Again, I mean, uh, Bush has shown that he is not inclined to appoint the sort of raving maniacs who Reagan often appointed, both to well, the national security post um, and to anything to do with matters like SDI. I mean, he, this man is not in to mm -hmm. Edward Teller or the man who said ra little radiation is good for you. Um, or anything like that, and it's true he does have doubts on SDI. So, again, I think, you know, what one's got is a government that looks like a sort of right-wing law firm, rather than a government that looks like a gun club or a John Birch Society reunion, as before. The doubts that General Scowcroft has on SDI, how is that going to affect the SDI program? Is he going to be able to halt it? Mm -hmm. uh, will it go in fits and starts? No, it's still up to Mr. Bush to move ahead with the program. Uh, we don't know exactly what his views are <coughs> as far as the future of Star Wars is concerned. Uh, I, I think he'll find that there is no turning back from Star Wars or some form of strategic defense. The technology, uh, the, the strategic realities are such that he'll have no other choice. The uh, question is how quickly uh, uh, he'll move. Uh, I don't think we can be optimistic that he will move quickly given all this budget uh, deficit talk and need for cuts in all areas. But uh, sooner or later, there'll be more movement. Other cabinet mm -hmm. appointments this week, uh, mm -hmm. Richard Thornburg being kept on mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> at Justice, uh, Laura Cavazos at uh, mm -hmm. Education. Uh, Thornburg, again, is somebody who's uh, uh, someone I think conservatives can live with very easily, uh, judging from the reactions from various conservative camps. Uh, Cavazos is another question. And I think uh, there was talk for the better part of two weeks that Cavazos would be out. But apparently he would have been the only uh, cabinet current cabinet officer who would have been asked to step down and uh, of, the, of the recent appointments. And so that was probably too controversial a decision to, because uh, Mr. Bush has promised to appoint a Mexican-American to a cabinet position, and the uh, feeling was that we might as well stay with him. Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. is this a sign that, that more of the Reagan administration will be kept over in the new administration? No. I mean, I think the few... Um, mm -hmm what should we say, professionals, um, the less ideological, the people who are, who are mm -hmm. more career-minded, professional poles, um, are, are going to have the upper hand and there'll be fewer, mm -hmm. they'll have to spend less of their time wondering what the real wackos are doing. And I think that mm -hmm. probably is deliberate, it probably does come out of Bush's sort of agonizing experience of being a deputy for eight years. Mm -hmm. Again, Mr. Cavazos is someone who will disappoint any admirer of William Bennett and if uh, Mr. Bennett is one of the wackos to whom Mr. Hitchens refers to them. <laughs> I, I regret his, uh, his poor choice of words. Uh, the trouble with Mr. Cavazos is that he will probably cave in, if he has, has not already caved in, to the education establishment, meaning primarily the National Education Association, which is run by a very left liberal clique. And they are, uh, and if Americans aren't happy with the state of education in our schools today, uh, let's, they'll be furious when they see what's happening during the Bush uh, Education. Another of the appointments uh, is Richard Darman at, uh, at OMB and the Washington Wire and the Wall Street Journal's 
uh, reports that Darman's no-budget ploy meets with bipartisan resistance in Congress. The OMB director designates proposal that Bush not submit his own rewrite of the budget due in January it would be a serious mistake, according to Representative Leon Panetta, who will probably head House budget. This article goes on to say, GOP congressional budgeteers are also wary of the idea, arguing that Bush should use the budget for a clear statement his, of his priorities. What do you both think of this, this no-budget proposal? Mr. I, don't, I don't blame them, is all I can say. That's what I'd be doing in their position. We'd be trying to put off the reckoning with the budget as much as I could. Well, I, I somewhat disagree because I think the atmosphere is right for Mr. Bush to suggest some very serious cuts in domestic spending. Unlike eight years ago when Mr. Reagan was savaged for recommending such things, uh, Mr. Bush will have much more support because uh, the, the same people who criticize Reagan so much about domestic cuts are also the same ones crying loudest today about the need to do something about the deficits. So Mr. Ma Bush has a mandate, so to speak, uh, to do something about the deficits. The, uh, the Washington Wire, uh, the Wall Street Journal, goes on to talk about uh, the meeting that's coming up between President Reagan, President-elect Bush, and Mr. Gorbachev. The, the smaller headline is, Lowered Expectations, Bush Aides Play Down the Gorbachev Meeting. Talk a little bit about that. Why is, why is this meeting being scheduled between the President, President-elect, and Mr. Gorbachev? Um, uh, I think apparently is that uh, Mr. Bush has to continue Mr. Reagan's soft policies toward Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, by playing down this, uh, this meeting, Mr. Bush is giving himself some maneuvering space for future dealings with Mr. Gorbachev. I don't think Mr. Bush is in any way naive about uh, Gorbachev and Soviet policies, and I don't think he's going to get himself cornered too early. Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. what does this meeting mean coming up? That seems about right, actually. I mean. It is, as they, as I always hate to say, but some of us have to say, too early to say. I mean, I don't understand why Gorbachev wants to meet Bush yet, <coughs> except as a sign of continuity. I believe he's got to come to the UN anyway. In the, um, in the new atmosphere created since the Washington and Moscow summits, it would now look odd were the General Secretary to come to New York and not meet with someone very senior, if not the President-elect. So I think it's simply that. But um, I would presume that the, the two key items will be Pakistan and Afghanistan and the Geneva Accords because the deadline of February for Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan is approaching fast um, and there's an interregnum in Pakistan as we speak which is very interesting I mean that's a coincidence that probably will have to come up and the other is depending on Mr. Gorbachev's um, volition um, the extreme isolation of the United States on the question of Palestine um, the United States government is now really Israel's only friend on refusing to treat with the Palestinians as the PLO, that's to say, as what they are, which is the representative of the Palestinian people, a role in which they are now globally and universally recognized except by Washington. So that might well come up too, um, given that Chairman Arafat is also due to address the UN in the Oslo, mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Uh, well, again, to return to the Palestine question, uh, the U.S. is being pressured, much the same way Israel is being pressured by uh, world opinion that is somewhat directed by uh, a, a very pro-leftist line that is increasingly hostile to Israel and increasingly hostile to the United States. Uh, Israel is our, one of our major allies, most reliable allies in the world, a key ally in the Middle East, and for us to suddenly back off, back away from Israel in support of, Palestine, uh, of the so-called uh, leaders of the Palestinian people, the PLO, who continue to espouse terrorism in all of their uh, Arabic uh, rhetoric. Uh, what they say in English is a different matter. Uh, would be just foolish and naive and uh, reckless. Is the Soviet Union in any, in any position to take credit for the moderation of the position of the PLO? Uh, I, I don't know what moderation of the PLO position really means because they haven't really changed substance substantively in their views on Israel. Uh, the recent rhetoric coming out of Algeria is, means nothing. The Washington Wire in the Wall Street Journal goes on to say, some analysts worry that Gorbachev may launch a new arms control offensive, perhaps on conventional weapons in Europe, during the presidential transition when Bush can't respond. Is that a worry? Uh, no, so long as we're uh, leaders of the NATO alliance, and uh, I think Western Europe wants us to continue to mm -hmm. serve in that capacity, uh, <coughs> I don't think it's a worry for the Bush administration. Uh, the Europeans might be naive enough to, uh, to pursue that angle, but if, if Mr. Bush and Mr. Baker show leadership, then I don't think it will be a major worry. Big election this week in Canada. 
the Progressive Conservative Party uh, won again, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. What are your thoughts on, on his victory in Canada? I'm, I must say I was rather surprised. It did look at one point as if economic nationalism and cultural nationalism was really the, the wave of the Canadian elections. Um, they certainly succeeded in making it the issue. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very interesting uh, lecture given by Robertson Davis, I imagine some people read here, is probably Canada's, well, I think actually Mordecai Richler is Canada's leading author, but mm -hmm. Robertson Davis has a claim to this role, saying that you know, we really don't want to be engulfed by the United States. My, my reply to Canadian friends about this is always, if you want to be distinguished from the United States, you must try and be more distinctive. Um, and I think mm -hmm. some such thought seems to have overcome the electorate. They, I think they suddenly realized, actually, what is all this fuss about? Um, we can't resolve it on a free trade question. If we're going not to be like the U.S., this isn't going to be the question that will decide it. Oh, well, in many ways, the Canadian elections remind me of what was happening in the United States earlier in the year. The left liberal intelligentsia, which tends to dominate Polit uh, cultural, political, uh, intellectual discussion, media discussion in the country was creating this picture of a movement against free trade, of, uh, of growing Canadian nationalism and resentment toward the U.S. and so on and so forth. Well, it turns out the people in Canada, by and large, are very uh, well disposed toward the U.S. They are close friends. They have no inferiority complexes of their, uh, when it comes to their own sense of Canadianism. It's just the Canadian um, intellectuals and uh, media people who are having the greatest difficulty because they're just uh, somewhat fraudulent in all of their uh, pretensions. And I might mention that uh, one of Canada's top writers, Mr. Richler, who was just referred to by, uh, mentioned by Mr. Hitchens, was in fact one of the exceptions in Canada and he was very much for, uh, for the free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. And he was a voice of reason and, and humanity and normalness throughout all this. Mm -hmm. Was the Canadian mm -hmm. election then totally mm -hmm. a referendum on free trade, or how much were the personalities uh, of the uh, of the leaders mm -hmm. of the parties that are involved in this? It's hard to tell because again, uh, during the earlier debates, it was said that Mr. Mulroney had done very poorly, and Mr. Turner was suddenly a, a rising star and uh, a great hope for Liberal Canada, and uh, yet Mr. Mulroney uh, somehow muddled through very effectively. My dad. Mm -hmm. If, if, this so, was a, if this was a referendum on free trade, mm -hmm. then does that mean other countries will now be lining up to mm -hmm. get the same kind of deal? I don't think any other countries in, in an analogous position. I mean, yeah. the fact is, Canada is half assimilated to the U.S. economy as matters yeah. stand, and um, the only the only mm -hmm. country in any remotely comparable position mm -hmm. is Mexico, which, for various reasons, nobody wants to have a free trade yeah, uh, area with. But but, it's but, but Western Europe is moving toward. Uh, free trade increasingly uh, by the 1990s. I think there'll be just one trade area. Uh, so oh, yes, it is. Sorry, it is. That's what you meant. Yeah, yes. it, it is a growing world. Uh, tr uh, I think uh, the trend in the world to uh, move toward free trade because people realize, by and large, that free trade brings economic growth and economic prosperity, and therefore a uh, greater human happiness and less human want in the world. Uh, if we can sort of loosen all of the statist and the inward-looking, protectionist uh, ways of thinking. Uh, the world's faces, I think, the, uh, every country in the world would be much, much better off. Is the next place for the U.S. to look, though, going mm -hmm. south? Is Mexico the next obvious choice to look for more well, I, I think so, yes, because um, there's already been a lot of talk that uh, some, at least northern Mexico should have a, been a, a free uh, economic zone for trade with the U.S. And I think um, people should push for that because we want to see Mexico do better. It's been saddled by uh, ghastly policies you know, over the years. And one way I think we can help Mexico uh, <clears throat> overcome its tremendous social problems is by getting Mexico involved in free trade. Mm -hmm. also, also this past week, President-elect Bush met with President-elect mm -hmm. Salinas of yes. Mexico. What does that meeting mean for, for both of them? Well, it reminds me of the meetings that almost every American president has with his Mexican counterpart. Uh, a lot of gr good things are said, but not uh, too many things are really acted on. Uh, Mr. Bush, as a Texan, uh, might actually uh, do more than his predecessors have in establishing better economic and other ties with Mexico. Mm -hmm. Do you see? There's also for the first time the question mm -hmm. of whether President Salinas, as the candidate of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, PRI mm -hmm. of Mexico, is really a, a legitimate. President, up, up until now the PRI may have fixed elections, but it probably would have won them anyway. Um, 
what was very glaring in the recent Mexican election is that despite the fixing, they didn't really win. And um, I think that that's a crisis just waiting to happen in Mexico. Now, the question of, of the Institutional Revolutionary Party and its, its ability to speak for Mexico and be counted on. The mo yeah, right. It must be uh, remembered that the PRI's major opponents in Mexico on the right were very much for free trade uh, and for uh, loosening uh, sort of privatization, uh, decentralization in Mexico to, to make the political atmosphere and economic atmosphere much less stifling than it is right now. So uh, uh, what Mr. Hitchens was referring to, I don't, I think, might be a, a somewhat of a canard from the left because uh, there were abuses throughout Mexico on all sides in these res recent elections. It's no, by no, no means clear that the PRI did not win uh, the majority of votes. Mm -hmm. The meeting itself, mm -hmm. the, uh, the style of the meeting of uh, President-elect Bush with President-elect Salinas, is that a, uh, a sign of things to come of President-elect Bush, these one-on-one, -on -one, these, these personal meetings? He's, he met with Margaret Thatcher. There's mm -hmm. a meeting coming up with Gorbachev, President Salinas. Is, it, is he going to be more of a one-on-one -on -one type um, mm -hmm. leader? It's hard to say. I mean, as he president, he should be. He won't need handlers and cue cards to the extent <laughs> that his predecessor did, and he won't <laughs> confuse the, but, the uh, defense minister with the ambassador as he did with a, as Reagan did with a meeting with but the president. But also, he, he's had, he has much more time right now during the transition to do just this sort of thing. I think his pressure on his time will be much greater once he's after his inauguration, uh, and he won't have all this freedom to, to travel uh, you know, around this country or to foreign countries to, to meet with foreign leaders. I mean, he shouldn't fall for the trap Jimmy Carter fell for, fell into right away. That is, he discovered foreign policy and, and just start flying around the world, espousing you know, silly things, uh, and just alienating the whole world. That is, uh, over his uh, hack amateurism. Mm -hmm. Good morning, and welcome to our program. This is our weekly journalist roundtable and viewer call-in program. We'd like you to join our discussion. We'll be going to the phones in, in just a few minutes. If you have a question or comment for either of our guests this morning. This morning we're joined by Vladislav Plevsinski. He's managing editor of the American Spectator. Our other guest this morning is Christopher Hitchens, a columnist with The Nation. You'll see the phone numbers across the bottom of your screen in the Eastern or Central time zone. It's 202-628-2525. <clears throat> in the Western and Mountain time zone, 202-783-2727. We have several lines uh, open out west right now, so if you'd like to call, we'd like for you to join us. We also have another phone number you'll be seeing across the bottom of your screen periodically. This is a special new phone number for international calls only. The uh, U.S. Information Agency's WorldNet uh, satellite system is carrying C-SPAN uh, around the world now uh, to more than 140 countries. We're on it uh, various times in different parts of the world. And so if you're watching us uh, in another part of the world, we'd like to hear from you this morning. Uh, be sure to dial your access code. And then the number here in the States is 202-737-6734. Again, that's for international calls only, 202 Seven three seven six seven three four. We'll go to the phone lines uh, in about five or six minutes. Earlier, when we were talking about uh, nominations of staff and uh, cabinet appointments, uh, President-elect Bush. One that we didn't talk about was one that uh, hasn't been made yet, and that's uh, Secretary of Defense. The talk is former Senator Tower. Mm -hmm. You think he will be the new Secretary of Defense? Um, I'm not sure, because just the way the story's been playing the last few days hints over uh, that uh, his personal life was is, was uh, somehow uh, unseemly or that uh, he kept some ca campaign funds uh, after his uh, retirement from the Senate. <coughs> uh, and though everything is legal and above board, uh, this is starting to be used as, uh, these, these, these allegations are being used, starting to be used against Mr. Tower, trying to undercut his, uh, his, his presumed nomination. So, uh, appointment. So it's, it's just it's very unclear right now. Christopher Hitchens. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I was in Pakistan for a lot of the speculation. Mm -hmm. I'm still catching up on, on all that. I'm willing to believe anything about the guy from what, what I do know. Um, his, the things in favor of him from the Bush point of view is that he's a completely reliable friend of the military industrial complex and will do always whatever it says. Um, and also that he has put the Reagan Bush outgoing administration very much in his debt by the Tower Commission, which deliberately, studiedly looked the wrong way in the investigation of the Iran-Contra scandal. So they owe him one. Whether they owe him defense, I really don't know. 
In talk of this particular appointment, there are also reports that they're looking for a, a manager type person instead of a political appointment. Uh, the name that comes up is, uh, escapes me, the head of Alcoa. Uh, what do you think of the concept of having a, a manager instead of a political type? Of Why not just turn it all over to general dynamics anyway? I mean, that's what in effect they've done. Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's ridiculous to, to say that the military industrial complex, so called, speaks in one voice when it consists of you know, a number of different companies and most. Uh, uh, defense contractors would rather not be in the government business because it, it's uh, costly. It's uh, they can make probably much more money in the private sector. Uh, it's very patriotic of uh, them then to yeah. um, make the money. Well, in the way it is, of course it is. Pretty soon we'd be hearing Democrats complaining that we're all our armaments are being imported from Japan or something. Uh, and <laughs> and as far as a manager, we had Robert McNamara, who's supposedly a a great manager, and he was a disaster. Looking back on things, uh, there's, there's, there's just this given that somehow Pentagon spending is, uh, is, is very too much, too expensive, and wasteful, and so on and so forth. Yet we never hear that, for instance, spending by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services is any way comparable, or uh, as far as waste is concerned. Why to is defense that? spending. Why, why, why do you think that? Because is? there's an anti defense bias. There's a basic sense in this country for coming from the left and repeated in the press that military spending is, is useless. We don't have to defend ourselves in the world. The world is not a dangerous place. That's what these people think. And they think that if we do defend ourselves, then we're somehow we're being aggressive, imperialistic, uh, saber rattling, uh, that we're destabilizing peace in the world. That we're the major threat to world peace, in other words. I mean, this is nonsense. But that's the way many people think, and that's the way the debate is being shaped. Christopher Hitchens, anti defense bias. Yes. Well, I wish that half of that was true. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, the very, the very um, fact that it's mm -hmm. referred to always as defense and as the Department of Defense mm -hmm. instead of as it used to be as the Department mm -hmm. of War and as preparation for war shows that the bias, mm -hmm. if there is an inherent one, mm -hmm. favors those who would call themselves pro defense, but who are in fact. Uh, only too happy to prepare for mass extermination and to make a profit while they're doing it for missiles that they get paid for whether they're fired or not, but if they were ever fired would be the end of all of us. Um, and which in themselves beckon war, because if you want war, so, prepare for war, as the old adage has it. So no to all of no, what I you just said. But I mean, mm -hmm. as to the business of the allocation, look, of course it's true there are rival companies. That's why you need a defense department so they don't, mm -hmm. so someone can allocate who gets mm -hmm. what. That's the point of it. Mm -hmm. The policy of the U.S. in this respect is to is to buy weapons at home and sell them abroad. That's what the uh, that's what the defense economy is for. That's yes, what's but, called but, military Keynesianism. But the Washington Post, of all papers, has been reporting that defense companies uh, would rather be out of government business because it's just too time, uh, just too costly, not cost effective to, to them. Well, I'll believe it yeah, when I see it. But in the meantime, I think it sounds like uh, self pity on the part of the profiteers. On cutting the deficit, the uh, the Post is reporting uh, this morning pushed back Medicare cuts to trim deficit. Mm -hmm. Aides predict drastic changes in program and likely. The Bush administration, this is a Spencer Rich story, the Bush administration will back substantial Medicare cuts of $3.5 billion to $5 billion for fiscal 1990 as part of an initial effort to cut the federal deficit. Your thoughts on spending cuts in this particular area of the budget? Well, politically it might be a little risky because um, Medicare, uh, catastrophic health insurance and so on was a major issue in the campaign and both candidates seem to be promising to uh, increase spending in this area. But again, I think there is a consensus for Mr. Bush uh, that the deficit somehow has to be attacked, and that means domestic spending, and that means uh, a lot of the waste in Medicare and uh, and in catastrophic health insurance. Uh, we'll probably be cutting back instead of moving ahead toward even more coverage, which will be just simply uh, much more expensive and not necessarily uh, effective in any sense. I mean, the retired people in this country are already up in arms over the recent bill. Uh, Inspired, uh, passed uh, last year um, under the, uh, or earlier this year under uh, Secretary Bowen's leadership, which is simply going to uh, increase um, surtaxes uh, on retired incomes, and, uh, and, and retired people who are, live on fixed incomes are not very happy at that. Mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. cuts in Medicare. Um, this is one of the large number of um, mm -hmm. announcements or admissions being made by the Bush transition team that they failed to make. Um, before the election. I mean, it's now become very clear that a huge number of things were postponed until now so that they wouldn't have to be faced by the electorate. But actually, the electorate could have figured out for itself that since the deficit's got to come down, they're not going to cut the war budget. 
they'll have to start cutting what are known as entitlements, that's to say things that make life worth living in the meantime. And sure, that's going to happen, yeah. Our guest this morning, Vladislav Plavchinsky, he's managing editor of the American Spectator. This is the November issue. What's the circulation of the American Spectator? We're around 40,000 uh, for a monthly. What's it cost to subscribe? Uh, now $27 a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, our other guest this morning, mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens, he's a columnist with The Nation. And this is the most recent issue of The Nation. Do you, have, you mentioned you've been in Pakistan. Do you have an article in this particular issue? Next one, if you want to see my thoughts on Benazir Bhutto. And our first call this morning from Miami Beach. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm on Medicare for quite a number of years. But lately, all the newspapers, the written papers and the uh, stations have been talking and talking and talking to cut the Medicare. You're afraid, you're making afraid of the, all the old people. Nobody's going to touch that. No, nobody. If someone is going to touch that, if the Democrats are going to touch that, they'll be the fault of the Democrats, not of the government of Mr. Bush or anyone. They're, you're scaring the people to hell. What are you doing that? What are you doing scaring the old people like that? You, the newspaper man, you should be scared shutting your newspaper and shutting your, the airways on, on the scanning people like that. You are all SOBBs, south of the border boys. Thank you, Miami. Christopher Hitchens, is it a scare tactic, reporting on possible cuts? Nope. It's not. It's, uh, the fact mm -hmm. is, as I just said, um, don't mind repeating it, uh, something's got to be cut. There are things that Republicans won't cut, um, particularly the budget for war. That means they're going to have to cut Social Security and Medicare and, and other things, and, and, and abort programs that might otherwise have been started to alleviate the condition of the growing underclass. But that's a decision you take if you vote for people like that. That's all. No, uh, that's a bit ridiculous because, first of all, uh, I'd like to reassure the voter that the Republicans, to my understanding, do not want to scare the elderly of this country. In fact, Republicans, unlike the Democrats, have great respect for this country's elderly, I think, and did not try to use the elderly as a, um, as a, as a foil during the last election. The problem is simply dollars and cents. Government, Medicare, Medicare and other types of insurance of this sort are extremely wasteful and not cost effective. What Republicans want to do is find better solutions, better approaches to this, this, this very important problem. And I think private insurance schemes are something that uh, Mr. Reagan was hoping to look into but did not. And I think Mr. Bush, you'll see under a Bush administration much more, uh, much greater attempts to do just this. Our second call is also from Florida, Boca Raton. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. I'd like to talk about the fact, I have three things. Number one, Bush has held at least four news conferences. He talks, it took questions for 15, 20 minutes. I watched it on C-SPAN in the last 10 days. I don't even see it reported on television. <clears throat> number two, this liberal press, and I want to tell the gentleman why we think there's a liberal press out there. I want you to get a hold of a tape that C-SPAN had a, a forum that uh, someone from the Washington Times had with about six or seven prominent Democrats, including uh, Senator Raw, Pat Cadell, Bob Beckel. Bob Beckel and Pat Cadell sat there and he admitted that the furlough, furlough program in Massachusetts was different than any other one. He said, but as a good Democrat, I said it wasn't at the time, but I'm telling you now, we knew all along that Dukakis was going to have a problem with this. What I want the press to do, just as they ask about Bush, about Iran and the environment, etc., I want them to challenge any candidate like Dukakis. When he says that Bush is lying about my record, the FCC hasn't got anything on file that there's any lies because that's what you do. If there's a commercial that lies or something else. and you file a, a statement with the FEC and you make a complaint. There was a flyer put out by the Democratic National Committee that had a picture of a Hispanic on it. Now, this was sent out in Texas, I think, but it was put out by the DNC. 
Nobody reported that, but every time I saw a Bush aide on television, they threw this Willie Horton thing in their face, and it wasn't put out by the Republican National Committee. And the Bush aide brought it up, I think, on Face the Nation. He finally showed it, but nobody, the media acted like they didn't know it. Also, just on this catastrophic health care, I knew from watching C-SPAN all the flaws in that bill. I tried to call local radio stations. They told me, you must be wrong. The elderly are not going to be taxed. They are not going to have to pay for the AIDS patients because we all should be paying that. All America should have to pay for the medical, uh, for the AIDS patients, not the elderly. And that's the way we want you to report. We want you to report before the facts so that we can write our congressmen and tell them how we feel about this so that they can start taking responsibility and about this budget. Okay, Florida, we've got a lot of ground to cover there. You hit a lot of different topics, so uh, we've got plenty to deal with on your call. Christopher Hitchens, she talked about uh, news conferences with President-elect Bush. Uh, do you think there will be more of them? Should there be more? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I was trying to digest that last call. Um, should there be more? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I'm not anxious to see them all that often, but it, it's, it's been deplorable the way that between the convention and his being elected, he didn't have an open news conference. And that was also borrowing on the Reagan precedent of exposing yourself to unscripted questioning as little as you can. Um, I think that's bad. On the other hand, on the rare occasions when there is a press conference, mm -hmm. uh, only deferential questions get asked. So I'm not really sure how, how, much, yeah. um, how much difference it would make. But since there's no other means, there's no parliamentary system that exposes him to questioning from the legislators. Um, I think it's, 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 a, it's a poor system, but a press conference is almost the only means of scrutiny that one has. Well, I think that's a, a, a bit ridiculous <laughs> because a press conference in its current form exists primarily to savage the sitting president. And it's not in his interest to have frequent press conferences because why should he subject himself to such abuse on a regular basis? It's, it's, it's enough for him to read the uh, morning papers or to watch evening news. He doesn't have to personally. Uh, uh, become a kind of uh, a, a, a target uh, a, a, for a shooting out in a shooting alley. Los Angeles. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good morning. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to make a comment, and then I have a question. The comment is, is that uh, I, I think that those those defense contractors that are so badly treated by the government, sh you know, should go back to private industry, and then I, th I think that when they would find out if their planes started crashing, like the B1 and so forth, that perhaps there'd be certain airlines that. That, that might not want to purchase their planes. I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that, uh, that that they probably do need a little bit more private industry and and capitalism in, in the defense in the defense business. But I have a question about the budget. I tried to ask the budget director this the other day on C-SPAN, but I, I I didn't get in. And that is is that have they made any provisions with the, with their plans that the, that they will let the dollar drop. This is the this is the the plan to to help the trade deficit picture. With their plans to let the dollar drop, are they increasing the pay of our servicemen overseas? It's a real. I've I've had calls. I've heard calls on C-SPAN from servicemen overseas, and they're having a hard time managing with this with this plummeting dollar. Are they making plans for this? And the American Spectator, I'm sure you've looked through, combed the budget carefully, the new budget carefully, so you'll so you'll know exactly what's what's happening. To the boys in blue. Mm -hmm. well, I, should, I must admit that I haven't combed the budget carefully because I, <laughs> I don't read Chinese. But uh, I think that's a real problem. Uh, and it only points, again, to the fact that so much of what uh, Mr. Hitchens would refer to as the war budget actually goes just to support the people who are serving our country. Uh, the majority, I think, of the funds go for salaries and, uh, and other such um, um, payments to our servicemen. And this isn't exactly uh, profiteering, I don't think. The caller also mentioned the, uh, the falling uh, mm -hmm. value of the dollar. Do you mm -hmm. think that's something that the new administration will, uh, will work to stop or, or like continue? Uh, I, don't know. I, th I don't expect th them to try to get the dollar to go up much higher. I think it was Mr. Baker's pol policy as Secretary of Treasury to uh, get the dollar to fall. Uh, I mean, it, it might help the trade balance, but it, it, I don't think it really resolves the long-term problems. Lakewood, mm -hmm. New Jersey, good morning. Hi, Mr. Hitchens. How are you? Morning. Uh, I'm a subscriber. <laughs> Love it. Um, <coughs> this election could not have 
came come out any better. I was just, I was really sitting there with my fingers crossed hoping that Bush was going to win. I'm a Democrat, I'm a side in the world Democrat, but it could, just couldn't come out any better. More Democrats in the House, more Democrats in the Senate. I think we're going to have, I mean, Mr. Bush is going to have a time. I mean, they seem, the Democrats seem to be very, um, they're try, trying to be very congenial. But I think when it comes, really comes down to the budget, I don't think we're going to have a budget until Graham Rudman is there to, to uh, start with the axe. Now, those, re, those conservatives out there really make me laugh. They don't want any homes for people. They're all out on the street. They want no Medicare, medical uh, coverage for people. Only the rich who can afford to get their own medical care and can have, like Mr. Bush, what, he's got three homes? Why does he let some of the homeless come into his house? Hmm. Uh, they're, they're, and, you know, that gentleman that's sitting next to you, that, that Bush shouldn't have a um, press conference. Mister, he works for us. We pay his salary. Thanks, New Jersey. More of a comment, Christopher Hitchens? Well, um, to be fair, just for a second, and I won't, I won't do this often to my colleague, Mr. Kroshinsky, I don't think he actually gloats over the homeless. But I think he can bear their pain mm -hmm. uh, with reasonable stoicism, as conservatives mostly can. The fact is this, we now, we now know that poverty is not an act of God or an act of nature. Um, most developed capitalist societies have a great deal less of it than the United States does. Agreeing not to do anything about it um, is, in a sense, willing it to happen. It's, it's not, not, not taking a decision, if you follow me, is taking a decision. Abstaining is a decision. Agreeing to leave this alone, the, the growth of the underclass, is as if you created it. And um, I don't know, I mean, the question is very seldom put in this way, but I don't know how bad things will have to get before the cry goes up that something ought to be done. And when that cry goes up, it's always a cry for people to think socially, people to think politically, people to think about a government that uh, assumes mm -hmm. responsibility. And um, I've no doubt that cry will come too late, but it'll have to come because we are going to have to be responsible for the way our neighbors live. One of our guests this morning is uh, Christopher Hitchens. He's a columnist with The Nation. He's been with The Nation since 1978, in Washington since 1981. Previously, he was foreign editor at The New Statesman. And he's from Portsmouth, uh, in Portsmouth in England, and he's a graduate, uh, has a graduate degree in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University. And he's also the author of this new book, Prepared for the Worst, a collection of articles uh, with a apparently gruesome uh, and art work on the front. What is this uh, book, Christopher Hitchens, and what's that uh, picture? It's a, it's a vanity book, Lou, of uh, the essays and articles that I've done over the last 10 years or so on various topics. Not all of them political. There's some literary ones and some uh, travel pieces and bits of foreign reporting. And the um, cover is a detail from Caravaggio's painting of Abraham just about to sacrifice his son, Isaac, just before he discovers it's a bad idea. And sure. hence the title. It makes a very good Hanukkah or Christmas present, I'm told, by our next call is from Chillingworth, Connecticut. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to address myself to uh, Mr. Hitchens and ask him if uh, the sour grapes, uh, I guess it's a humorless sour grapes attitude of the liberal media uh, doesn't in fact betray their contempt for the electoral process. That's the question. Um, your question seems to contain its own answer, sir, but I mean, I think I know what you mean. Um, Sour grapes. It, I don't think, look, it wasn't a campaign, will you, will you go this far with me, that anyone could have been frightfully proud of. Nobody seems to have thought it was a very honorable or very deep or very admirable campaign. Um, whether that would lead people to have contempt for the electoral process or not, I think, I think it's unsafe for you to assume that that's what is at stake here. I think rather people are depressed that the non-voters are now almost the largest party. Well, certainly they're the largest party, almost the majority overall. Um, depressed at the low standard of the campaign, depressed at the low standard of the debates, depressed at what's politely called negative campaigning. Um, and since all this seems to have worked more in favor of Mr. Bush than Mr. Dukakis, I suppose the, the liberals mind about it more. But I, I really don't think that conservatives would be wise in saying, well, if it, if it uh, brought us George Bush as president, there must have been an okay campaign 
think that would be a very poor reflection on the operations of democracy. I want to ask you both about a, a news story that will be coming up over the next few weeks. This is uh, this morning's Baltimore Sun. There's a story by uh, Lyle Dennison of the Washington Bureau of the Sun. Uh, the headline is, Issue of Pardon for North, Left Hanging for Now. Mr. Dennison writes, The unusual minuet with top ranks of government uh, over possible pardon for Oliver North in the Iran-Contra case is continuing into the holiday weekend, indicating that his chances may be fading but are not yet lost. President Reagan's White House staff appears to be intensifying its recent efforts to discourage press speculation that a pardon for the retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, but still will not say finally or flatly that it's been ruled out. It's going to come from this story. Ladislav Kleczynski. Oh, uh, I can't tell, but uh, perhaps around Christmas, uh, President Reagan will pardon Mr. North and the other dependents, the so-called Iran-Contra case, simply because uh, it's a political issue, not a criminal issue. And uh, if you criminalize foreign policy, then our country will be in great trouble. So I think as a parting gesture, Mr. Reagan, if he were to pardon uh, Mr. North, would probably be supported in this by the majority of the American people and probably be uh, very sharply criticized by the majority of the American media. But that's business as usual. Christopher Hitchens, a pardon in the works for Oliver North? I think it, I think it has to be a pardon because it would be so perfect. Then one would, be, then the Republicans would be able to say, um, no one got punished for this scandal. Uh, nobody was brought to justice for any of it. Nobody really did anything wrong. Everything's fine. Relax. And they can only do that if they pardon the key defendants and just to just count on people having a short memory. I just say they will. It's very important that this scandal be completely victimless. And what I think it shows is that they're squishy soft on crime. But I think that they've been squishy soft on crime for a very long time. Their sympathy is all for the criminal in this case. Los Never Angeles. for the victim, which is democracy. Los Angeles, good morning. Good morning. Although, Mr. Hitchens, I'm, I'm on your side, but uh, Thank you. we show a little lack of respect for your people when you smoke, so don't smoke anymore, at least on this. I was just lighting up. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, California Club. Yeah, California again. I think everybody feels sorry. You sound like an ex-smoker yourself, if I may say so. An ex-what? You sound like an ex-smoker yourself. I got a, was that just an early morning rasp? Got a bad cold this morning. Oh, my commiserations. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, I, everybody should feel absolutely sorry for the uh, for the defense industry. You got it too tough. There's no question. <clears throat> nice first comment. Second comment is uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bush does has, does have his work cut out for him. And although I voted for uh, Mr. Dukakis. I think that uh, uh, Mr. Bush may turn out to be less conservative than a lot of people expect. And uh, I sure would like to see him do some good things, and uh, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt for the time being. Thank you, Los Angeles. Less conservative, Christopher Hitchens? Yeah, I mean, yes, as I said before, it's more like, more like a white blue chip right-wing law firm. You know, professional, interested in the money, interested in its own success and advancement, rather narrowly based, perhaps rather unimaginative, but not like the sort of wilder, um, utopian, reactionary, uh, deluded um, elements that were allowed into the Reagan administration, although they are about to be pardoned for their contribution. Well, I'm, I might only add that with the, uh, we haven't mentioned him yet today, but uh, New Hampshire Governor John Sununa, who will be Mr. Bush's chief of staff is probably uh, the most conservative White House uh, key aide uh, since Edwin Meese's time in the White House. So I think that's a, a sign that Mr. Bush will be significantly conservative in many areas. He certainly has a debt to pay to the right, don't get me wrong, and I'm not, I'm not advertising him as a moderate, but he's not right wing in the way that Reagan and his immediate entourage were. He's, yeah, Mr. In fact, he has no real taste for the battle of ideas at all, Bush. Surely you wouldn't say that he mm -hmm. did. Uh, I think he can surprise you in that area. Him. I think mm -hmm. ideology bores no. him. He just I mean, wants, but know. he's also very good at something conservatives haven't been that good at up to now, and that is politics. He understands politics, likes politics, relishes politics, and conservatives have to learn to do the same. Another of our guests this morning mm -hmm. is Vladislav Plevchinsky. He's managing editor of the American Spectator. He's been with the magazine since 1980, and his writing has also appeared in the National Review and the Wall Street Journal. He has a B.A. in History from the University of California at Santa Barbara and has done graduate work in Soviet Area Studies at Indiana University, and he's from Santa Barbara. And we have an international call from Frankfurt, Germany. Good morning. Good morning. 
This is Bosch Stamets calling from Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, first of all, let me say that you're really doing a good job. I'm a new user for the German cable TV, and so this is the first time I can uh, look at C-SPAN. I think it's quite great. There's one simple question I would like to ask you. Uh, is there going to be, or do you expect to be, any change in the Nicaragua policy with the new president elected? You might know that uh, this is one of the major topics in the German public, uh, which is, well, discussed differently and where we do not uh, usually quite agree with the policy so far in the U.S. Frankfurt, before you, you go, let, let me ask, before our, our guests answer your question, let me ask you about, uh, you're watching us this morning, you say, is that on a local uh, cable TV system in, in the town you live in? No, no, this is general. This is not a local cable. This is, uh, you might know that the cable system uh, is by the German Post. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the call, Frankfurt, Germany. Christopher Hitchens, uh, Policy in Nicaragua. Yeah, I've been asking myself the same question. Um, it looked, just before the election, very much as if even Reagan himself had lost heart as far as the contra aspect of the Nicaragua policy was concerned. That's to say that he had bowed to recognition of the inevitable that they were a shower of riffraff and the sweepings of the former Somoza regime. They were militarily hopeless, politically stinking and corrupt and dealing in drugs and uh, hired gunmanship, all of which has been true for anyone who wanted to know ever since he first sponsored them. I think the attempt to, to ruin the Nicaraguan revolution by economic warfare will go on. I think the blockade will go on. I think the petty persecution of Americans trading with Nicaragua will go on, uh, in spite of the World Court uh, decision that makes that um, wrongful. And um, I think the attempt to, d to destroy the Nicaraguan economy, the economy of an underdeveloped, impoverished country, will go on unless people are seized with a sense of how disgusting it is for the United States to be driving a poor country into bankruptcy um, in order to make a point about the, the face and credibility of its own leaders. Um, if Mr. Bush is going to go on having these kind of gentler meetings with Latin American leaders and so on, it will be one of the first things they tell him, you know, lay off this, forget, forget the idea that you can be the bully and policeman of Central America. Uh, well, Mr. Hitchens' compassion for the Sandinista regime uh, even exceeds his compassion for uh, so-called victims of Reagan social policies. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, he, Mr. Hitchens insults the freedom fighters in Nicaragua. Uh, these are peasants. These are poor people. These are people who are alienated, so to speak, from the um, Ortega regime. Uh, people who are sick and tired of the growing poverty, impoverishment of Nicaraguan society. And these are people who do not want to spend a, the rest of their lives in uh, Marxist slavery. Sick of the poverty when the Reagan administration's mm -hmm. declared mm -hmm. tactics in Nicaragua yes, have been to burn the crops and destroy the economic infrastructure uh, to, that's mine, another to mine invention the of your you create, you create poverty, you create poor people, and then mm -hmm. you claim the right to yes, speak yes. for their, yeah, I mean, morally, for their poverty when they take up arms. Well, this to talk about how, why do the high-living Sandinista rulers uh, do so well for themselves, live in mansions, uh, drive fancy cars, Oh, well, this, uh, is, this is a wonderful application messages. of class yes. warfare. Exactly, and, the right. and that's what the people you've suddenly found, cannot you've suddenly study, found a group of you suddenly found a group of privileged people who you don't like the look of. Well, no, but, uh, people this who is not serious. Socialism, this love of the serious. people. It's not serious. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. most, the Sandinista leadership does not live high off the hog. Nobody in Nicaragua mm -hmm. can afford to. The suffering is common mm -hmm. and general. When the lights go out in Managua, mm -hmm. they go out. Yeah, yeah. Somehow they manage to have access to hard currency and. Uh, somehow they're about the only people in Nicaragua able to buy consumer I, goods. I'm sorry, I just think it's mm -hmm. disgraceful that someone who supports the policy of making Nicaragua economically miserable should then take, yeah, a, high, think, should then take a high moral the tone about the distribution of resources there. By, uh, by its adherence to Marxist economic policies, has uh, adopted a policy to uh, make life in Nicaragua miserable. And we'll get Northvale, New Jersey. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have just one comment and a, a question. The Customs Department says drug imports are $110 billion per year. That's $10 billion per month. The trade deficit is also about $10 billion a month. Doesn't this, in effect, make the trade deficit double or $20 billion a month, since the government doesn't rep report or combine these items? Thank you. Wow. Dr. Slavoshinsky? No, I don't, I'd rather not handle that one. This beyond my economic I, skills. I will, yeah. it makes me want to go and find out more, I must say. I mean, I had not thought of the figures in that way. Um, it does seem on the high side, but no. Well, thanks for the thought. I don't, I don't have any, I can't think of anything straight away to say on that.
The uh, President Reagan announced this week that he would not be signing uh, a new ethics bill. The deadline uh, was uh, to be midnight on Friday. Uh, there will be a pocket veto of that bill. Mm -hmm. What do you think the political fallout will, will be of, of him not signing the new ethics bill? Well, I don't think there'll be much political fallout simply because it's another attempt to uh, hamstring people who want to serve their country. I mean, if we want uh, good people coming to work in Washington, we better not uh, create silly rules that will make their lives just impossible once they get here. Christopher Hitchens? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there'll be much of an outcry either because I think more and more people have realized that the term ethics in government is an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. And certainly under the Reagan administration, the revolving door mm -hmm. between business and private enrichment and government service was such a blur that you could hardly tell on which side of it people were. Again, a, a, a case of absolute squishy softness mm -hmm. on crime. Everyone was bleeding heart over Michael Deaver having been caught perjuring himself as well as being on the take. So it said, oh, well, it's because I was a drunk most of this time. And, oh, well, in that case, you don't have to go to prison. You don't have to suffer at all. Everything's okay. Soft on crime. All the sympathy for the criminal. None for the victim, which in this case is good government. Well, it's curious that Mr. Hitchens uh, is, is being implicitly critical of liberal social policy that Mr. Deva was simply trying to take advantage of in his defense. Uh, that is a bit feline of you, I must say. Uh, Mr. Deva's main interest was not, I think, in the welfare of anyone but himself and arguably the Deva family. Um, there was one moment when he, to everyone's surprise, took up the issue of acid rain, something the Reagan administration spent a lot of time not worrying about. But then it was revealed that he was under contract to the Canadian government very shortly after leaving office in the White House. No, I mean, as I say, I think what we have here is not so, what you might agree so with the acid rain is a non-issue. Socialism for the rich, socialism for the rich, and free enterprise for the poor. That seems to be the wave of the future. We have about a half hour left in our discussion this morning with mm -hmm. Vladislav Plevchinsky of the American Spectator and Christopher Hitchens of The Nation. Our phone lines are full, so if you're on the line and it's ringing, uh, stay on. Your call will be answered in turn. And you'll also see the other phone number across the bottom of your screen for international calls only. If you're outside the United States uh, watching on the USIA's uh, World Net, we'd also like to have you join our conversation. Dial the uh, international access code, and the number here then is 202-737-6734. Our next call is from Brooklyn, New York. Good morning. Yes, good morning, uh, gentlemen, uh, mm -hmm. and also thank you for C-SPAN. I have uh, three very uh, quick questions. First of all, I'd like uh, Mr. Blazinski to expound just a bit on his quite obscene statement that Mr. Bush is, not, is entitled not to have press conferences. Uh, number two, uh, will Mr. Bush be a Teflon president? And number three, what will uh, Reagan Bush or Bush Reagan do about Noriega before January the 20th so that Mr. Bush will not have to deal with that after he's inaugurated? Thanks, New York. Well, well, well to answer the first part of the question, again, I don't think it's written anywhere in the Constitution that a president is obligated to hold regular press conferences. Uh, he can hold them at his pleasure. Uh, the, I don't think the American press, the self-appointed guardian of, of, of scrutiny and uh, and uh, presidential what, propriety uh, has any right to demand regular press conferences, especially given the tone of these conferences, which are invariably hostile, uh, disrespectful, and destructive of public policy. The caller mm -hmm. also asked about uh, mm -hmm. General Noriega. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen there? Uh, I have no idea. It's something that will probably be resolved domestically in Panama. Christopher Hitchens? Mm -hmm. Um, the caller also asked whether I think Bush or whether we think Bush will be a Teflon president. I've come to the conclusion, which is not, not a, a welcome one, that there's something Teflon about the presidency in that um, people now seem not to want to know anything bad about the presidency or the, or the occupant of the presidency because they fear that this is, in a sense, bad for the, the nation or the country. And they identify, therefore, it's only a short step, the occupant with the office. I, I've come to the conclusion that's a bad thing politically and that the, the imperial or monarchical presidency is, and, and the Teflon that has to surround it institutionally, is bad whoever the occupant is. And believe me, I would have said this if, if it had been Michael Dukakis or Jesse Jackson uh, who'd won the election. On, on Noriega, it's going to be really difficult for Bush. I accept that he can probably count on the press not asking because Mr. Pashinsky is quite wrong. The press on the whole avoids awkward questions of this kind. We do have the testimony of Stansfield Turner when he was at the CIA that he had fired uh, Noriega from the CIA payroll only to see him rehired by Mr. Bush. Mr. Bush was never asked that during the campaign because he never had a press conference. If it comes up again, it'll be interesting to see how his denials of wrongdoing on Noriega's part hold up. Seattle, Washington, good morning. 
Uh, yeah. Don't you think that the press and the network have a responsibility to the public because the public can't get to the candidate and the press can. Don't you think they have a responsibility to get the issues to the candidate? Caller, let me ask you how you think they should go about doing that. What, are, what should they be doing that they're not doing now, in your opinion? Well, for one thing, uh, okay, like this last election, they just let the candidates go, and the candidates choose what the issues were. And I didn't hear the press say anything. They just, they let it go. And I think the press really needs to stand up and take some responsibility for uh, the amount of power that they really have. Thanks for the call, Seattle. Well, again, I, I, I'm a little confused by the question because uh, there's obviously a kind of an interplay between press and politicians in which each tries to use the other or to advance itself. And if we look at this transition period, uh, no sooner was Mr. Bush elected than the press created the so-called debt issue, which is in, uh, the, the budget deficit issue, the trade imbalances, um, the need for new taxes, that this is the only realistic way to to uh, to think of policy, even though the election could be seen as a mandate for new, no new taxes. I don't think Mr. Bush was lying when he said, uh, just when he asked us to read his lips. Uh, so the, obviously the press has its own agenda in a, in a, in a general sense, which it wants to advance. Uh, politicians uh, are obviously aware of how the press operates, and they try to manipulate it in their own uh, interest, to their own advantage. Do you think mm -hmm. that happened during the campaign? Mm -hmm. Was the was the press manipulated? A lot of our calls during the campaign, mm -hmm. people complained about not hearing about issues. Uh, whose who's fault That's was that? The candidates or the or the press? Well, it's think? probably television's fault because television just goes for the very superficial uh, issues. But if anyone followed uh, the campaign th through the major newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Times, the Washington Post, they would see that issues uh, were very very widely discussed in the press. Mm -hmm. Mount Vernon, New York. Good morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my comment is that I served with General Eisenhower in the Second World War in Europe. He's a great general. These two gentlemen are evidently very young. Did they ever hear of the Bechtel Corporation? And do, uh, do, uh, do they know that uh, Mr. Weinberger and Mr. Schultz, where they came from before they came to government? And also, a, a second part of the question, did they ever hear of Mr. Ross Perot, who only a, a week ago said on, on, on your station that uh, Mr. Oliver North, they asked him whether he should go to jail, and he said, well, I'll answer it this way. Mr. Oliver North not only had the green light, but he had the freeway from two of the highest offices in the land. He could do more than the Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, more than anyone. And uh, my third question is the, SL, the SLs in, in Texas where Mr. Perot touched. He said they should all go to jail. It seems to me we have two standards of justice. We, our veterans are allowed to sleep on the streets. Five million people go hungry. But charity should begin at home. I'd like a comment from both of these gentlemen, a true comment. Thanks for the call, Matt Vernon. Stay on the line with us. I don't think we quite understood uh, your question about the Bechtel Corporation. Well, uh, the Bechtel Corporation, sir, is, is the, mili uh, the industrial military complex that General Eisenhower always talked about. He says, beware of it. They run this country. I mean, who's kidding who? Thanks, Matt Vernon. Christopher Hitchens? Yeah. Um, on, the, this, on the meat of your question, which is um, what H. Ross Perot said about Oliver North, of course that's true. Of course North was acting under orders when he did what he did. You, you don't get a government like the government of Israel negotiating with any old lieutenant colonel who turns up on a private mission unless they have the assurance that he is acting with the authority of the president. It is as simple as that. What North did, he's not lying for once when he said he was acting under orders and with the knowledge of his superiors. Um, it's because it's essential uh, for various reasons to the authorities that that does not come out or become clear that there probably isn't going to be a proper trial, maybe not even a trial at all. 
Um, yes, of course. As I was saying earlier, there's, there's an enormous contrast between the extraordinary solicitude of the government towards major corporations, especially in the defense industry, the feather bedding of the already rich, and the free enterprise attitude they take to those who don't have any capital. And the fact, therefore, that a country as rich as America has an underclass much greater and in much deeper trouble than any other capitalist country has is not is not an act of God, it's an act of policy. And that's the right way to think about it. And I like the way you put it. I might begin uh, by saying that I wonder if Mr. Hitchens realizes that the more the U.S. has spent on social welfare, the more poor people the U.S. has produced. Uh, the government has been spending hundreds of billions of dollars over the last two decades uh, in an attempt to help the poor. And in fact, it has created only greater misery uh, for these people. Uh, so obviously government, uh, government spending is not the solution to poverty in this country or, or any other country. And as far, far as Mr. Uh, former Lieutenant uh, Colonel North is concerned, all I can see uh, that North is guilty of is fighting, and fighting communism too, uh, too openly, too uh, ambitiously. And apparently that is the crime he's uh, being accused of. It's not what the special mm -hmm. prosecutor is actually charging him with, is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's being charged Well, with, he can uh, come up with a lot of legal uh, kind of uh, uh, detours or uh, mm. White plane. attempt to focus this. But again, the independent counsel sh uh, should have been fired long ago, and the whole institution is a sham. So, you know, White Plains, New York, our next call. Good morning. Yes, I, I have a comment, and then I have a question uh, for C-SPAN, actually. But um, first, my comment is that whatever they do about the budget deficit and however much they want to spend for the military, they better <clears throat> make sure they spend the full dollar and not line 30 cents of that dollar with in somebody's pocket. Now, my question to C-SPAN is, what happened to the Jesse Jackson seminar, uh, the seminar on Jesse Jackson's press that came out of the Iowa program? Uh, and I know it was scheduled to air over the weekend, um, or uh, over the, uh, the uh, yeah, Thanksgiving when holiday. Were, uh, when they were showing it live, it got mm -hmm. cut off. What happened? There were uh, some technical problems with the, uh, as is the case in this business periodically, with a lot of technical equipment, uh, some of it breaks. And it's my understanding that uh, the satellite uplink uh, out in Iowa, the weather was uh, especially cold. And it's my understanding that uh, some equipment froze and that led to other things going wrong. And so, uh, so we did eventually get the tapes of that and the tapes of that have aired uh, several times. And I think most recently uh, uh, yesterday over the Thanksgiving holiday. We have another international call from uh, Toronto, Canada. Good morning. Um, the deplorable lack of participation in the American political uh, system is frequently cited as example that the, the non-voter is really not, um, not in favor of either one of the two candidates. And, and I'm not certain that that's the case. And I wondered uh, to either one of the two gentlemen what we know about the typical non-voter. What's his profile? And, because I suspect that um, a number of non-voters, um, really are perfectly satisfied either with one candidate or the other uh, or both. Canada, let me ask you while you're still on the line, uh, what was the turnout in your election? Uh, well, I think it was considerably higher than it was in the United States. I'm actually, I'm an American citizen living in Canada at the moment. Thanks for the call. Voter well, turnout? Obviously non-voter mm -hmm. studies are, go are going to be a growth industry as we progress mm -hmm. and that's a pity in itself. At the moment we don't know an awful lot about non-voters <clears throat> it's suspected that it, will, that it must correlate with two things. One is illiteracy, which is alarmingly on the rise, and in certain parts of the U.S., including this, this very city, actually, is nearly at third world proportions of functional illiteracy. The other, I think, is indigence, is people moving and not knowing where or how you register, because in this country it's not enough that you exist, that you be a, a voter. You've got to do more than that. You've got to do more than be qualified as a voter and taxpayer. You have to go through, some, in some states, considerable difficulties to get on the roll and not everyone knows where to begin so that's that's as much as I know so far about the non-voting profile that you'd be right that an illiterate um, indigent politically ignorant person would be happy with one or other of the candidates I'm sure is true that's well, also, well, there's a story in today's New York Times I think on just this question and they emphasize that number uh, most of the non-voters tend to be young so therefore they're just uh, a bit flighty 
and don't, or don't have strong opinions yet, or are still irresponsible, still think of themselves as school children who don't have a civic responsibility to take part in the voting. Uh, some people are poorly educated, I think according to the Times, uh, which can mean many things because many people with so-called educations are also very poorly educated. Uh, and there's also the question that voting registration, uh, that people simply might be too lazy because you have to register a good a few, several weeks, I think, before voting in most places. And most people just don't bother, put it off, and by election day it's too late for them to vote. Along those lines, the uh, Washington Post has a story this morning, being there unnecessary for Republican victories, GOP credited in rounding up absentee voters. And the, uh, it's a Charles Babcock story, and the point of this story is that in several uh, close races, both as it turns out in Florida, that the, uh, the voters uh, in Florida voted for one candidate, but when the absentee ballots were counted in both cases, the, uh, the other candidate won by a very small margin. Long Island, New York, good morning. Morning. Uh, we're all talking as if this divine right presidency we've had over the last few decades is all powerful. In other words, as if no Congress exists. And I'd like to ask the, the panelists if they, they share my uh, horror when I hear people like Ollie North and other people talk about my president. Uh, it sounds Shakespearean. It sounds like my king. You know, uh, it's, it's, I hate to say this, but as a feminist, it's awfully macho. Uh, I will die for this man. Well, what about the men and, and women, few of them, in Congress? Are they not fighting back? What, what do you think about Congress's uh, po possibility of, of thwarting rampant capitalism or rampant anything else from the White House? I read it very low. There's a terrible book you might get called Men of Zeal by two mediocre senators from Maine, Cohen and Mitchell, who were both on the um, adorably bipartisan. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. You couldn't ask for more. They were both on the Iran-Contra committee. They, they give you the story of why it failed. They said they couldn't, they couldn't bear the thought of unpopularity. They were afraid if they questioned Fawn Hall, she would cry. I don't know how that makes you feel as a feminist, but anyway, that's what they say. They were afraid, though, they had the evidence that if they called North a liar, they'd get lots of mad telegrams and be written up as being on the wrong side of Olimania. They were completely supine, and they appear to be proud of it. Um, and these are... Um, probably two of the uh, more literate uh, members of the deliberative body. So you're, you're right, I think. It's been extremely depressing to see how the imperial presidency can end-run Congress on foreign and domestic and defense policy with the additional extraordinary propaganda mm -hmm. victory of looking all the time as if Congress is bullying them. That's the bit that's really, that's the bit of genius that Reagan brought to the, to the, to the show. Um, I, I very much fear that um, Mr. Bush is going to be uh, awarded a honeymoon period as well. Well, Bush all, well, this week, uh, we haven't mentioned this yet, but this week we observed the 25th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And of course, we had uh, just kind of nonstop uh, television coverage of this event uh, with, with you know, hours of fascinating footage of President Kennedy in action. And somehow, uh, looking back on this period, I just don't recall uh, President Kennedy ever being um, criticized, uh, only perhaps by the very, very far left, for being an imperial president or simply being a, a kind of king or even a very macho king. And people loved him, uh, and, and I think those who remember him probably still do, even if they've been somewhat disillusioned or because of the pain associated with the assassination, they've somehow blocked off a lot of the affection he once felt for him. Uh, but it's, it's clear Americans, and I think people generally, like to be led by by one person, not by a gaggle in Congress of unimpressive, of very yeah. unimpressive people. Could I just say, Lou, not for the sake of even-handedness, that I agree with that, and I think that it's sinister that you can get uh, liberals and <coughs> centrists and intellectuals like, say, Arthur Schlesinger on the television openly referring with huge sentiment and pride to the idea of Camelot, which is actually a medieval model of monarchy, mm -hmm. as the ideal for Kennedy. I think it probably did start with Kennedy. I think the worship of presidency and presidents is bad for democracy. And I would recall to you the words of Eugene Debs, the great leader of the American Socialist Party, who was jailed during the First World War, who said to his followers, uh, I would not lead you into the promised land even if I could, because if you can be led in, you can be led out. Uh, don't look for leadership in that way. Do not become worshippers of power and authority. And I think that that, rather than any particular president, is, is the problem. Champaign, Illinois. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I know Mr. Hitchens has uh, written in the past about some 
um, gentleman inside the Defense Department who uh, <coughs> are part of the revolving door that you're talking about when you talk about the uh, socialism for the riches and uh, free, free enterprise for the poor. Mr. Uh, Stephen Bryan, Mr. Richard Pearl, and then another character who's revolved back and forth, Mr. Michael Ledeen. Mm. Can you comment on those gentlemen? And I'd like to hear both gentlemen comment on whether people like that will come back into the government and what we can do about uh, this particular problem. Well, um, Mr. Ledeen, to take the example that I've written most recently about, I actually haven't written about Brown and Pearl, though I, I know about them, um, is an excellent example of, of what I mean by the sort of uh, free enterprise um, foreign and defense policy that one saw so much of in the last eight years he found that the best way to conduct foreign policy was through arms dealers. He was the man who proposed Manuko Gorbanifar, who's an Iranian pimp and dealer in death, as a foreign policy broker. And the fact is that there are always going to be people like Ladin, who, w with friends and shady connections like Gorbanifar. The really extraordinary thing is that he got so far into the apparatus with this kind of suggestion that we franchise foreign policy to this rug merchant and, and arms dealer that he was really not stopped until it was too late. And so there is something apparently very vulnerable in the executive branch to um, the confusion of, of brokerage and of private enterprise and private enrichment with foreign policy aims. And I think that, that rather than the existence of these shady characters, is the problem. Well, I, I think Mr. Uh, Hitchens has been libelous in his references to Mr. Ledeen, who is one of the finest uh, minds in Washington, from what I can tell. He's a superbly educated, uh, very talented, very brilliant foreign policy analyst. He's also served the, uh, this country as a consultant. Uh, he's extremely knowledgeable about foreign policy, about defense policy, about uh, even security policy. And uh, he's been subjected to a, a kind of endless barrage of um, of malicious reporting, a lot of innuendo. Well, wait a minute, are you calling me a liar? Are you saying that no. Michael Ledeen did not introduce Manico Gorbanifar as a foreign policy mm -hmm. contact into the process? Uh, it is alleged that he did. It is but again, he, he was did. serving the National Security Council and he was uh, therefore serving the executive branch and, and, and his president in trying to establish contacts in Iran, a very strategically important country to the United States. And to accuse him of, of some kind of underhanded, um, dirty dealings is, is simply just. Um, it's a, just a, 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 a libelous slur, and it avoids the real issues Mr. Ledeen was dealing with, which is our Middle East policy, and generally our Iran policy specifically. People don't even start to ask why the only currency mm -hmm. these people know is weapons dealing. Why is that the only way they can make a foreign policy contact? Why is, why well, is, welcome the, why to is the, the policy of the country so much mm -hmm. uh, oriented to this kind of, I would call it gangsterism? It's, it, this, mm -hmm. These seem to be the only contacts they can form. The only, the only contracts they can make and the only code they can abide by is that of arms dealing mm -hmm. with, in the case of the Contra policy, um, mm -hmm. a little drug dealing thrown in. And then they tell you it's the real world. Well, it isn't the real world. Um, it's I, an aspect of the real world is, that they mm -hmm. seem to find more appealing mm -hmm. than most people do. All right, I'm that's sure, why they go to such pains I'm sure the to Soviet keep block government secret. That's uh, why they, exports, that's uh, why they replace mm -hmm. the, do the doctrine of accountability with the doctrine of deniability mm -hmm. because they're ashamed of what they do mm -hmm. and it's probably not legal. And well, foreign policy right has never be. been uh, a game played by Marcus of Queensbury rules. And alas, alas. Marcus of Queensbury yeah. rules allow you to be very tough. There's nothing patsy about the Marcus of Queensbury mm -hmm. rules. We're talking about the, we're talking about the privatization, the franchising of policy to uh, people who are interested only in private gain. Mm -hmm. And and we live in how, it was how a disastrous you, consequences there's absolutely of that. that. Again, private gain. He was serving the National Security Council, serving his president. And and that well, that's, I'm afraid, called, I'm that. afraid that's and very much the same. Under this president, that's very much the same thing. thing. We'll, get well I don't think the American people would agree with you. They've elected this president well, that's overwhelmingly. The American people, and that's because so much such, mm -hmm. such lengths were gone mm -hmm. to to keep all this mm -hmm. secret. If it was so great, mm -hmm. why are they so ashamed of it? Why do they cloak it? Why do they lie about it? Why do they attempt because to discredit it will be witnesses? Because distorted by the press that will be reporting it. No, no, if they've they, got a good reason to hide. Mm -hmm. you know, and to hide. the American people, as you fondly call them, mm -hmm. the, the more they find out about it, the less they like. I don't think you have any right to claim that that. that that a secret corrupt doctrine enjoys public support it hasn't Francisco. been tested. Let me get San Francisco and then we'll come back. Let me get San, San Francisco, go ahead. Law of San Francisco. I um, wanted to ask you both about a story that is on the front page of each of the papers that we receive here at C-SPAN in the morning from uh, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, Richmond, uh, about the headline in the uh, New York Times, a Soviet-esque halt in ethnic unrest in two republics 
night curfews enforced, troops deployed. Government officials appeal for calm today in the Soviet republics of Armenia and Azerbaijan as security forces move to quell renewed ethnic unrest in the region. Uh, is this something that's going to escalate? Is this going to become a major problem for Mr. Gorbachev? It is his major problem. problem. Well, of course, I mean, the Soviet, traditional Soviet policy of divide and rule when it comes to ethnic groups is coming back to haunt Mr. Gorbachev and his uh, attempts at so-called reform. I mean, it's, we forget that the Soviet Union is the last colonial empire in the world, and uh, there are scores of non-Russian ethnic groups living within the Soviet borders who do not want to be controlled by Moscow, uh, want uh, self-determination, want to live free and independent lives. We're seeing this taking place in a remarkable way in the Baltic countries, where the people are extremely articulate, uh, where these people are uh, part, uh, members of the uh, of Western civilization. These are European peoples who've been subjected to incredible Soviet cruelty over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, and they're finally finding a way to uh, reassert themselves. And Moscow will have to listen if it doesn't want to uh, fall back on its old, uh, on its Stalinist uh, policies. Mr. President. It already is Gorbachev's great, greatest mm -hmm. problem, and he's acknowledged it by calling for early next year a special party congress on the nationalities question. With uh, the Baltic states of Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, um, Mr. Pruszynski's quite right. I mean, they, they are in fact not national minorities. They are small European states absorbed within the borders of the Soviet Union by the Hitler-Stalin pact, and that's a pact that nobody has to honor, and if, which even the Soviet Union is now in the process of repudiating. So with them, the real question emerges of whether they want to remain within the Soviet Union or governed by it. With Armenia and Azerbaijan, however, that, doesn't, that isn't the problem. Armenia and Azerbaijan don't want to leave the Soviet Union. What uh, what Armenia wants is a bit of territory that happens to be within the Azerbaijani border. So they have a very intractable problem. They'll quarrel for Moscow's support between two constituent republics. Um, and that, that's going to be extraordinarily difficult for them to resolve. I should just say, though, I mean, though I don't dissent broadly from what you say about the Soviet Union as an empire, the Armenians are the last ones who are going to ask to leave because in the neighboring NATO country of Turkey, which is the second largest recipient of American military aid, it is illegal to mention the name Armenia. It is illegal to mention what happened to the Armenians when they were massacred before the First World War by the Turkish authorities. Their, the name of where they used to live has been erased from the map. Their culture has been obliterated. And uh, no, no rights for Armenians exist at all. It's a total negation, and that takes place in a NATO frontline state. So if you want the ironies of nationality and nationalism, in our time, you won't find them only in, in the nations of the Warsaw Pact. Riverhead, New York, good morning. Good morning, C-SPAN, and good morning, Mr. Hitchings. Good morning. I'd like to make a, a little statement and then a small question. Uh, at least we forget, or at least the radical right wing forget, some 42 million of us did not want Mr. Bush. It seems to have been forgotten that now we're going to all be friends together after we've been insulted and vilified and, and ridiculed as, as those people. That's my statement. My question is, now that millions of us are still wallowing through the old Bush lies about Noriega and his, his daily meetings in the Security Council where he didn't hear anything or know anything, now it seems as if we're going to get a, a whole new bunch of new Bush lies. Uh, is it possible some way for the press to try and catch up with the old lies before we get into the new lies? He just, he just campaigned on, on, on approving the ethics bill and now he doesn't want the ethics bill. He campaigned uh, as if he was going to try and get legislation to outlaw the ACLU and do away with furloughs, then there's no mention. And those were the only and primary things he spoke of in the campaign. Uh, is there some way possible to get the press to try and sort out all the lies about Noriega, about everything? Riverhead, New York, thanks for the call this morning. Well, I think you'll just have to read The Nation. We find it's very steady work keeping up with uh, Bush's lies. We also find that we... Um, very often are the only ones who bother to keep account of them. I um, uh, have to put in a plug sometime, it may as well, may as well be now, but we've, I don't think we've even begun to, uh, to catch and uh, tie down and analyze 
all of them, and you're right, they do keep coming very thick and fast. Lying is something that comes to him alarmingly easily. Um, it's something that he resorts to with, I think, a slightly worrying sort of uh, skill. Um, in fact, it is one of his few political attainments. Well, well, one lie we should sort out right away is that Mr. Bush was proposing legislation to outlaw the ACLU. I mean, that's a bit ridiculous. In fact, Mr. Bush said he admires the ACLU. He just says he doesn't want to belong to it, which is the right of every American to belong or not belong to the ACLU. And, as for, uh, and I can also reassure the caller that uh, in four years there'll be another Democratic convention, and I'm sure we'll see more of the same uh, <coughs> lampooning of Mr. Bush that we saw in Atlanta in, in August. So, I mean, Democrats will have their day in court again. Let me get Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan, go ahead. Yes, I wish to address this primarily to Mr. Hitchens because I want to say that uh, I think I speak for a majority of the American people when I laud Ali North for his daring action of trying to, to safeguard our nation from eventual takeover by the communists because the, uh, I, I believe that uh, the trying to settle the thing down there uh, according to the Arias plan is a uh, setup whereby uh, we are the the uh, Sandinistas are uh, helped by the communist uh, Soviets completely and uh, yet the, the Sandinistas or I should say the Contras are handcuffed and we cut off all their aid and then expect them to to uh, conduct a decent war. Flint, I'm going to let you go on. Flint, let me, let me let you go on that. We have just a few minutes left. We'll let Mr. Hitchens respond and then try to get in one more call. Well, I don't know whether you speak for the majority of the American people or not, but you certainly learned your lines very well about the Reagan North. Uh, it's everything's okay. Uh, he's a hero thing. And I think people are able by now to judge that sort of propaganda for themselves. Vladislav Blachinsky. Well, I think Mr. North has demonstrated on countless occasions in service to his country that he is indeed a hero. And the one reason he was so well received and uh, why Congress was so humiliated in trying to persecute him was that people could see through uh, the political uh, sham that was being thrown at him. We've talked this morning about, uh, about the Soviet Union, about Central America. What is the biggest uh, foreign relations problem that will face the new administration? Well. I don't know if there was any single, one single problem, but obviously they all begin with Moscow and Mr. Gorbachev and um, Soviet intentions in the world. And from there we can uh, break down a number of other areas, uh, the Middle East, uh, Central America, obviously. Which, but again, these are in many ways extensions of what's happening in Moscow. Uh, one area that we do not talk about much, uh, but I think is cr critical to the uh, in, well, uh, will be increasingly critical in the next century is the uh, is East Asia, the Pacific, Western Pacific, uh, where a number of booming economies have uh, revolutionized uh, international trade and where uh, the majority of the world's population is centered, uh, where China is making some feeble attempts to uh, join in on this action in East Asia. Uh, Somehow from in Washington, that part of the world seems very, very far away. And I think if our capital were in San Francisco or Los Angeles, we'd have a much better sense of what's going on in East Asia. Christopher Hitchens, one big foreign policy area? Well, since I can only pick one, and <clears throat> I, I agree with you that the general hierarchy is to do with relations with the superpowers, in particular the Soviet Union, but I think the one that's going to be the most salient is, is the Middle East, and that's for the reason mm -hmm. that um, the policy of Israel um, is so directly attributable and made possible, uh, attributable to, I rather say, and made possible by American military and political aid. And if the rejectionists, a term that's hitherto only been used of the Palestinians, are going to be the Israeli right, the religious and political right, who look as if they've now come to power, who intend to hold on to all that they've conquered in war and make no, no compromise at all with the Palestinians, if the United States continues to be the only country identified with that policy, then I think it will, it will continue to be a very grave sore. Um, and it, it's about to be put quite graphically to the test with uh, Arafat's visit to the United Nations and the attempts made to stop him even getting a hearing. But the, again, I think there's something ludicrous to isolate Israel as the major <coughs> foreign policy issue that our country and the world faces. This is a very small country. Just 
trying to uh, hold its own in a very dangerous part of the world and to single Israel out as the uh, source of all unrest and stability, uh, injustice in the world. It's, it's just, just, just No, of course I didn't do anything of the kind, as you would have heard if you've been paying attention. I simply said that to the extent that Israel is able to be Again. a rejectionist country... Mm -hmm. Are you calling it the number the, one uh, foreign uh, policy I area? Think for the, for, that is because of U.S. foreign policy. policy. It's Post therefore a salient American responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's what my questioner mm -hmm. asked me to address myself. No, this is something, the Israelis are a sovereign state and uh, they act in their own interests. Uh, they don't act at our behest. Militarily, they are, they are wholly dependent on the United States. And Christopher Hitchens okay. has the last word. Our guests today have been Christopher Hitchens, columnist for The Nation, and also Vladislav Plevchinsky, managing editor of The American Spectator. I'd like to thank them for being with us, and also thank you once again for your calls and your comments. Have a good day. If you would like to contact either of our guests, you can write to the following addresses. Mr. Hitchens can be reached through the offices of The Nation, 447 15th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20002. To write to Mr. Plashinsky, the offices of The American Spectator can be contacted through Post Office Box 10448, Arlington, Virginia. The zip code there is 22201. Coming up next, the remarks of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Make the most of your C-SPAN viewing with the C-SPAN Update.